Episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show. Again, bringing you another fascinating guest uh, involved in creating a better tomorrow on some really unique fronts. Um, we are back with our friends at the uh, at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy today and have the honor of being joined by Dr. Charles Tahan, who is Assistant Director uh, for Quantum Information Sciences and Director of the National Quantum Coordination Office at the White House, uh, OSTP, uh, which ultimately is ensuring uh, coordination of the National Quantum Initiative and various quantum information science activities across the federal government, industry, and academia. Uh, Dr. Tahan is on detail from the Laboratory uh, for Physical Sciences, uh, University of Maryland, where he drove technical progress in the future of information technology as technical director, uh, where his research was focused on computing, communication, sensing, everything from novel device physics to high-performance computer architectures. Uh, he was involved in standing up uh, new programs in research initiatives in silicon and superconducting quantum computing, quantum characterization, verification and validation, uh, and new and emerging qubit science and technology platforms. As a practicing physicist, uh, he was chief of the intramural quantum information um, sciences research programs, working with students, postdocs uh, from the University of Maryland uh, Park Campus to ultimately generate uh, original research in quantum information device theory. Uh, his contributions have been recognized uh, all over the place as Research of the Year, uh, the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers, uh, elected fellow of the American Physical Society and as a uh, Office of the Director of National Intelligence Science and Technology Fellow. Uh, Dr. Tahan earned his PhD in physics at University of Wisconsin Madison, uh, undergraduate in physics and computer science, uh, William and Mary. Uh, and from uh, 2005 2007, he was an NSF Distinguished International Postdoc Research Fellow uh, at the University of Cambridge. Center for Quantum Computing Technologies in Australia and University of Tokyo. Uh, he also served uh, for a period of time as a quantum information science and technology uh, consultant at DARPA in the Microsystems Technology Office. Uh, a lot of really interesting topics to get into today. Uh, that all being said, Dr. Charles Tahan, thank you so much for taking the time out of your schedule to come talk to us for a little while. Yeah, thank you. I mean, thanks for that nice introduction. Please just call me Charlie. Yeah, Charlie, it, it's great having you. Um, I, I'd love to start off, you know, as we typically do, by handing you the floor for a little bit, just to uh, take us through a little bit of that early journey, ultimately, how these intellectual interests that I mentioned in STEM, in computer science, in physics, ultimately <laughs> transitioned you over to this world of spin and entanglement and coherence and everything else interesting and wacky going on <laughs> in the quantum world. Uh, sure. I mean, it's a long journey. I, I grew up nearby in Northern Virginia. I, I guess it started with my parents. You know, my, my dad is a uh, immigrant from Lebanon. I grew up installing air conditioners with him on this in the summer. My mom um, has a bachelor's in chemistry, New Jersey Irish. Uh, she, you know, helped me do science fairs when I was in elementary school. I think that probably got my the bug of science in me. I I, I used to love reading pop science books about wormholes, you know, Star Trek, uh, the next generation, you know, yep. <laughs> these are the early formative experiences that yep. made me want to change the world with technology. I mean, that was my dream as a kid. I guess my first love was astronomy. I was, I was that guy trying to make a telescope in his garage. I mean, it didn't work, but I, <laughs> I was trying. 
Um, but then I found computers. I, I was really lucky in high school, uh, two, two teachers got some grant from the NSF to start an after school program in earth system science, marrying it with the, this thing called the internet, you know, and this was mm -hmm. 93, 94 around then, you know, Netscape had not come out. It was early releases, releases of mosaic. And the idea was NASA was providing earth science data on the internet. Could you do that and make a web page? So I, I discovered my first Mac and I sort of added that to the whole physics. For some reason, early on, I decided I wanted to be a physicist, you know, before I even knew really what that meant. But then I found computing. And so that those two things always were, were an interest when I went to college. And then in, in college, I majored in physics and computer science. Um, spent a lot of time in the physics library doing, you know, <laughs> physics homework. And one day I just happened to find a new book on quantum computing. And I was like, wow, this has got both physics and computer science <laughs> together. You know, this is this is going to be it. And I distinctly remember, you know, maybe a year or two later. So I wrote like a book report on it for a, one of my classes. And a year or two later, when I was working on computational physics with my undergraduate you know, advisor, he asked me, you know, what did I want to do in graduate school? And I said, oh, I want to go theoretically design quantum computers. And he just laughed and said, you'll never find that. <laughs> and it, he was completely right until the next year. Well, it just happened that in 2000, the government started funding in a big way hardware development research programs. And I just happened to be at the University of Wisconsin, was a, which was an early leader in, in quantum computing, some of the quantum computing technologies. And just it was just really lucky <laughs> that um, that happened. Uh, so I ended up getting into quantum computing um, that way. And, you know, the rest is history. I've, I've gone through many different jobs you know, we can we can talk about. But I guess at the end of the day, there's many different ways to impact your field in a career. And I've kind of experienced all of them. Absolutely. You know, it, you know as you just mentioned, you, you did your initial dissertation work uh, entitled Silicon in the quantum limit, quantum computing and decoherence in silicon architectures. Um, extensively have published um, over the the next couple of decades uh, uh, many pieces. I, I enjoyed this one in the 2021 opinion piece that you wrote uh, entitled "Democratizing Spin Qubits." You know, talking about your journey, but also that you know um, we still have challenges in this area in terms of material and fabrication and and all the control components of what it takes to. Uh, realize, uh, you know, these quantum dynamics in computer systems. Um, I, I did an episode, actually, uh, it was uh, several months ago with uh, uh, Kazuhiro Gomi from uh, Nippon Telephone and Telegraph, who was you know, all excited about the state uh, coherent icing machines. They were talking, I don't know, they were icing. I, I, I think cakes right away, right? I, I enjoy <laughs> icing. Um, but, you know, this had to do with optical quantum neural networks. I couldn't tell if it was a, a true quantum computer or something kind of like it. To give us sort of the lay of the, from a layman's perspective, it's sort of where we are in 2023. Obviously, the quantum sure. computing, you know, that Hollywood shows us is this infinitely powerful computer that can solve every problem that we're concerned about in a second, and we got no more problems. Where, where are we in 2023 uh, in, in terms of quantum computing? Yeah, it might be useful to give a little bit of history. Sure. So if you look back to the 1980s, people started thinking about well, if you take information science, you know, this, this, these abstractions, zeros and ones that we've built computers out of uh, programming languages, and you marry that with quantum mechanics, which really describes how the universe works. Like the, our best understanding of how the, the universe really works is described by quantum physics. Yeah. If you put those two together, you can, you can ask yourself, well, what could a quantum computer do that a, a normal classical computer built on this human abstractions of zeros and ones right. not do. And they found a few examples, very primitive ones, kind of toy models that showed that a quantum computer could have exponential speed up or at least a, a speed up that a classical computer could ever meet. So fundamentally, you know, and I spent most of my career pursuing this dream of how do you build a quantum computer? Is it even possible? You know, could it do anything useful? But fundamentally, what we're talking about here is a foundational shift in information technology. Like our whole foundation of, of 
of what information science is has changed because of including quantum physics into into how we think about information science. And you've got to believe that that's going to have dramatic implica implications for technology. Mm -hmm. we, we have a few examples. You know, for example, a quantum computer that's big enough, we believe can break um, some of our public key and cryptography, which is yeah. based on certain hard mathematical problems. It turns out a quantum computer is really good at uh, checking a lot of, uh, this is this is a poor analog, but a, a poor way to think about it is a, a, a quantum computer can pursue a lot of different paths simultaneously. And if you're very clever, give you the right answer to a certain question. That if you can check it easily, might provide a, a very fast speed up. You could also, it's not a big leap to imagine that a quantum computer would be good at simulating the world, you know, chemicals, materials, physical processes that happen are based on how the universe works. And that happens to be, you know, based on the rules of quantum mechanics. And it turns out nature does that pretty efficiently, right? But when you try to calculate some of those processes, like the, the dynamics of a of a caffeine molecule, um, that's hard to do on a classical computer because every time you add one more atom or one more degree of freedom, the size of the problem tends to, to double. But on a quantum computer, you know, it's presuming you can build one and other, many other caveats, it should be much more efficient because you're, you're really trying to simulate what the universe is doing anyway. So those are the things that pursue, that, that motivate physicists, chemists, um, information scientists to to go after quantum computing. Now, in terms of the technology, you know, we're, so Shore, Peter Shore, a, a mathematician at AT&T AT &T Bell Labs, published his famous algorithm on factoring numbers on a quantum computer back in 93, mm -hmm. 94. That got the world interested. But it wasn't until, you know, the end of that decade, 2000, 2001, that we really started to pursue can you build qubits, like the fundamental building block, the, the analog of tr transistor for quantum? What is the best approach to doing it? You know, is error correction on a quantum computer even possible? That started around 25 years ago, 23 years ago. And it's been, you know, slow, steady progress building up to those concepts of like, what, what, would, what would be the vacuum tube <laughs> for a, a, a quantum computer, let, you know, not even getting to the, the transistor yet? And which type of system could scale to the many types of qubits we need to actually do an algorithm that's useful? So that's sort of some of the background. Mm -hmm. In terms of where we are in the technology, we still have a lot of vacuum tube <laughs> vacuum tubes in the running. You know, there are many different technologies that could realize a quantum computer. At the end of the day, we're trying to find a system that's like an atom, uh, you know, a single uh, atom. Mm -hmm can be in, in, in the microscopic scale because it uh, behaves like a quantum particle. The fundamental thing you're looking for is something that can maintain a superposition or can be in two states at once. It can be both up and down at the same time. That's called quantum superposition. It's sort of the heart of building a quantum computer. Yeah. So all of quantum information science, quantum computing is based on quantum technology, which is have been growing over the last few decades of our ability to trap a single particle, like an electron, like a photon, like an atom, to manipulate it and measure its state, all while maintaining its quantumness, its good quantumness. And how we can put those together has really been the subject of a lot of government funding, a lot of uh, working universities, and now, you know, over the last five plus years, industry, trying to put, take, take one of these rudimentary qubit technologies put them together in bigger and bigger systems and see if it still works, if it still stays quantum. Does that help? Absolutely. Absolutely. No, I, I appreciate you laying that out. And um, the, uh, you know, be before we get to um, what you're up to now, currently at uh, uh, OSTP, I, I thought it'd be interesting to um, walk through 
some of what we talked about or some of what I mentioned in in the bio of the show, because I really think it it, it tells a neat story about how you've uh, honed these skills um, to, to serve in this current position. And, and, and one of the places I'd love to start um, was your time with uh, DARPA Microsystems, because that, um, you know, uh, we had Vic Victoria Coleman on just a couple of weeks ago, you know, chairing the, the Exploratory Council there, introducing to us, uh, you know, a little bit about what she was thinking about back then when she was running DARPA. Uh, obviously, DARPA, we've had a bunch of DARPA guests on, great environment, it seems, to um, let people like you run uh, for, mm -hmm. for five years, at least, with these ideas about quantum and and, and, and other interesting concepts. Um, to, the, to what you can talk about that doesn't violate any national security stuff. Well, tell, tell us a little bit about your DARPA time and, and a little bit of what, what you were focusing on in terms of microsystems as they pertain to quanta at the time. Sure. So I worked in the microsystems technology office. I, I had uh, graduated from Wisconsin with a physics PhD. I did a two-year crazy international postdoc sponsored by the NSF. I worked at, in, in England and in, in Tokyo and Japan. Yep on quantum, not necessarily quantum computing, but quantum systems. I decided I wanted to come home. Uh, and I had met uh, one of the technical consultants of the DARPA programs earlier on in my graduate career. So the way DARPA works and many of the funding agencies work is they sponsor research going on in universities. Yeah. And you know, unbeknownst to me, my advisors or professors at, at university were getting funding from DARPA and, and other agencies. And some of the DARPA representatives were going to all the meetings. And so I got to know them. And when I came back, I said, well, I ran into them again. They said, why don't you come in for an interview? Uh, so that that's how it happened. DARPA is an amazing place. You know, if astronomy yeah. was my first science love, DARPA was my first you know career love. It was my first real job. It's a very unique environment. It, there is no one DARPA. It's constantly changing. People yeah. rotate, you know, after four years, usually at most. Uh, so there, there is no DARPA. There's a DARPA of a certain era, but DARPA in any era is fast paced and, and designed to to try to make you influence the world, you know, as as much as possible in a short time. So I, I like to describe these things to people who are looking for careers in science and make sure that they know that there's not just the professor scientific route or research route. There's also these other routes like being a program manager, managing large programs in the government, or policy and, and other things. But this this particularly route of, of managing and proposing and creating new programs can be really influential on your whole field or even beyond. The basic idea is you get creative people who come in, they, they, oh, they find out about something like quantum computing. They say, well, this sounds really important. If we don't, if we miss this, that'll have a big impact on the US. DARPA's mission is to prevent technological surprise. So we need to get in this and we need to, to help create this field. So you you work, you go out and you talk. And I was a, a technical consultant when I was there to one of the program managers, a former Bell Labs person who was an expert in quantum computing, but had a deep background in laser physics and physics. So I provided the, the technical expertise in quantum computing and, and related technologies to help him make the decisions on who to fund and not to fund. So that kind of job, you 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 get a very broad uh, scope of the landscape very quickly. You know, whereas as a in a PhD or in research, you're trying to be the expert on one specific little thing. Here, you're trying to understand the whole scope of the field and what's needed to move it forward. It's one of those situations where you look back and you're like, that felt like ten years, but it actually turned out to be one year because the yeah. learning curve is so is so yeah. fast <laughs> compared to what you were doing before in a different job, you know, your brain has to reconfigure. So DARPA is an amazing place. Um, when I was there, I helped start the quantum entanglement science technology program. So really broadly speaking, what can quantum entanglement do for new technologies? What are the new science that might come from it? Sort of the foundation of, of quantum information science technology. And also quantum information science programs to actually push forward specific technologies like silicon quantum computing or super mm -hmm. quantum computing to see how far they can go. So that was a great, um, really amazing experience. You know, <laughs> looking back, it was I think two and a half years, but it felt like much more. When that ended, I or, or what happened then is you know, the program manager I was working for said, "I'm going to retire." And I'm like, "Well, I don't want to frame for anybody else, so maybe <laughs> I have to." 
maybe I have to go to the government now. So I ended up going to LPS, Lab of Physical yeah. Sciences, which is a which is basically the physics department of the National Security Agency. Right. So back after World War II, NSA set up a uh, a research group at the University of Maryland College Park with the, basically the same goal. You know, how do we prevent technological surprise for the intelligence community? How do we understand where computing is happening, communications going on with communications and sensing? How do we stay at the cutting edge? And the best way to do that is to actually hire scientists to work at the cutting edge with university partners with industry. Yep. And so I went there and I I did two things. I stood up a research group in the University of Maryland, pursuing my own research in qubits, and I became a, a government program manager like those DARPA program managers to run quantum computing programs. Um, and then over time I, you know, ended up running the the group of program managers who does all the sponsored work and then I took over the group doing the, all the intramural work at at the lab and then became technical director and, and so on. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about that because I find um, sort of these unique laboratory situations as you were just describing per LPS and NSA fascinating, you know, whether we're talking about uh, Johns Hopkins advanced physics lab, we, you know, the, uh, there's the George Bush, um, uh, Combat Development Center at Texas A and M now, and you really you know you're mixing students with this you know extreme materials, directed energy, hypersonics, you know all of the bleeding edge stuff. At LPS, you really went beyond quantum computing. I'm mean, here you're getting involved in advanced manufacturing technologies, material sciences. Um, I enjoyed this uh, this uh, video that's online there uh, with a, a Dr. Alyssa Martin talking about uh, integrating uh, you know quantum concepts of electronics, uh, you know sort of 3D printing them into textiles mm -hmm. that can do really cool things. Take us through a little of that because I think that also now brings in, you know, while you know, some of the, the quantum encryption stuff may get, uh, people might just, you know, that might gloss off. Or here we're talking about sort of real world stuff that uh, maybe not today, but hey, I, I, here's my a quantum shirt. I can buy a little bit down the line that does some cool things. But uh, take us a little into sort of the the other, beyond the quantum uh, computing stuff that you were doing at LPS. I think that's Yeah, absolutely. LPS is a really unique place. You know, where, to give you a little bit about how R&D funding works in the government, you know, there are many different Agencies in the government each have their own mission, their own uh, way of funding. You know, so there's National Science Foundation, who funds very broadly um, advancing of science. They give grants to universities, to, to principal investigators, to other, to other institutions to do research, but they don't do research themselselves. Yeah. DARPA, in that sense, is the same way. They don't do research at DARPA. You know, yeah. you come in and you, you might. Uh, scope what needs to be done and really technically drive getting there. But at the end of the day, you put out a call saying, who wants to do this? Yeah. You, as a DARPA uh, program manager, fund them to go do it. And you just monitor their progress and you might help them steer them technically, depending on the goals. But at the end of the day, there's a big separation between those doing the work and those funding the work. LPS is a lab. We're, we do the work. You know, at the end of the day, we are responsible, like Sandia National Labs, well, any of the national labs or, or federal labs. You know, our mission is to prevent technological surprise, and we will do that however is best. We could do the research in-house, meaning we do we write the papers, do the experiments ourselves. We work with students. We could uh, sponsor it, do calls like DARPA does, working with other agencies to sponsor research and, and have that separation. Or any hybrid, you know. At the end, because at the end of the day, the the results are what matter. LPS itself, as I mentioned, started out of this idea that you know to really for the government to really know what's coming, they need to work um, with the best people. And so from the beginning, it was a a, a lab joint with the University of Maryland, where we have government uh, personnel, we have University of Maryland students, postdocs, professors, um, research scientists. And you know contractors as we need them to fulfill its mission, and the mission really goes around you know three ideas: one, you know, stay five to ten years out, you know, think about what's coming to mm -hmm. prevent surprise, you know, 
try to push it forward if, if, if appropriate, and sometimes try to develop prototypes that might be need, you know, be used to demonstrate that this technology is real. So quantum computing is a great example because 20, 25 years ago, you know, even to this day, we don't know if a large scale quantum computer is possible. It was much murkier back then. So it really was a great uh, test case for LPS. You know, how, how, do, how do we even approach this problem of what kind of qubit type could be the winner? Is it possible to make them good enough to do a quantum computer? And so on. So at LPS today, we have three main offices, one focused on high performance computing, sort of the higher level of the stack, you know, take, take a problem that um, you might care about, what is the best way to, to compute it? Um, is it an exascale computer? Is it a neuromorphic computer? Is it a quantum computer? Try to run that um, do simulations of how good it would be, would it justify an investment to invest in like memorist or technology? Does that make sense? Or should we just wait more and more year and, and, and see if CMOS just beats it, you know, for, for this, you know, for much cheaper. So high performance computing really looks at big systems. Are they relevant to the problems we care about? We have a division on solid state and quantum information science, which traditionally was cryogenic devices, magnetometers, stuff like that, but is now mm -hmm. mostly focused on computing. And then we have a division focused on advanced manufacturing and sensing. And this goes back to the, the legacy of how do you sense fields? You know, how do you um, uh, uh, do mapping in complex environments by sensing the gravity field? How do you communicate with the best, you know, highest efficiency? So, for example, fiber optics was a very strong historical investment in the lab. You know, the whole transition from copper wires to fiber optics. Mm -hmm. uh, advanced packaging. You know, if you want to make better computer chips that are more efficient, less power hungry, how do you package them to, to make that happen? And that's evolved into... Uh, 3D printing, you know, how do you make specialized circuits? How do you how do you do uh, do them on 3D geometries for a variety of applications, for example, putting a sensor on top of a, a rocket or something like that. So th that's sort of the motivation, you know, if you think about computing, sensing and communications at the foundations of information technology, what are, what is the cutting edge and what will matter in five to 10 years? You know, so we are the experts that other people in the government can come to and say, well, is quantum computing going to matter? <laughs> you know, when and when do we need to worry about it? You know, when do we need to update our codes? Same thing for antennas and other things. That's really the whole point of LPS. Excellent. Excellent. And so now with that, um, DARPA, LPS, clearly, <laughs> Charlie, why you were selected uh, for this incredibly important role Um the National Quantum Initiative Act uh, signed in, in the end of 2018, broad goal, accelerate quantum research development for economic and national security of the United States. And it, it's interesting because when you go to sort of uh, your responsibilities across the agencies, I mean, you know, we, we, you know, we had uh, uh, Andy Hebler on talking about health and SNA talking about space, but you've got everybody here <laughs> that, that has some, everything from the USDA to uh, to NIST, to NSF, DARPA, all down, down the line that has interest in quantum. So, so you have a lot of, <laughs> you have a lot of clients here, let's say, yes. um, talk, run with this one, take your time with this one, because you've got a lot yeah. of responsibilities, uh, per everybody <laughs> on this yeah, one. So true. take your time. Uh, Maybe I'll start on. by just revisiting this concept of why quantum matters to people. You know, obviously it's, it's a hot topic. World Quantum Day is kind of, we're gearing up for that. Um, it's it's very cool. You see it in the movies being used. You know, some some right. apocryphal sometimes. Why does it matter? If you, I started by talking about this shift in information technology that, you know, our whole understanding of it has changed. We have a few examples, but those are pretty good examples. Let me, it, the way this manifests, uh, you know, the the way quantum science translations to technology. It's, it's into specific use cases. So in quantum information science technology, it's a very broad kind of fundamental field. We we break out the technologies that will come out of it as computing, sensing, and networking. And in each case, we look at these traditional classical technologies and see, well, how could looking at quantum or quantum properties of matter 
change the way or improve or fundamentally create new modalities for how we could do each of these missions? You know, how can we use computing or sensing? So it might be useful to start with a, a couple examples. Sure. So for sensing, the, the best sensors we have are clocks. And the global positioning system, it turns mm -hmm. out, is based on quantum clocks. And it's it started back in the 60s when people were able to start trapping few atoms, single atoms. And it turns out that a single atom, the two energy levels, you know, quantum 1.0, which is particles are quantized. We have atoms, electrons, photons, but also energy levels in an atom are quantized, meaning there's, there's a very specific frequency between levels in an atom. Because the frequency is so stable and because atoms are all exactly alike because of quantum mechanics, it turns out they make great clocks. And you can use that understanding and, and add in classical control and readout technology to make you know, very sensitive clocks, which you can eventually put in space. And this ability lets us set time globally, which the, the, the magnitude of that for our society is just immeasurable, We're estimated at at least a trillion dollars. But I couldn't get you know to work <laughs> the most morning <laughs> if I didn't have my GPS. But it's used also for in military applications. It's used sure. um, for data synchronization across data centers. It's really it just sets time for the whole world. That's a great example of quantum 1.0. Quantum 2.0, which starts to take advantage of the the phase, not only the discrete nature, but the phase of these atoms, the quantum, the quantuminess, what Einstein would call the spooky action right. at a distance, that will just improve clocks even more. So you can imagine creating entangled clock sensors, um, you know, much better clocks that that give you even more precision, even you know, to the point of being able to to map the Earth to to look for earthquakes, stuff like that. Another great example is medical imaging, you know, the magnetic resonance imager, MRI, you know, the big tube you go in, um, which everybody loves, you know, that is based on our understanding of, of atoms, I mean, how they process due to quantum mechanics. And you know, again, that, that ability to, to image inside our body non-invasively has just been, you know, saved how many countless lives. Imagine you know, as we greater and greater take, understand the information side of this, the, the coherent part, could you make a sensor that you could just wear around your neck? That's the equivalent of MRI all day, every day for the rest of your life, you know, things like that, making things much less intrusive are the promise of quantum information science technologies that we're, you know, very hopeful about. We want to see, you know, especially for sensors where we have demonstrations in the lab already of this type of sensitivity, how we can move those from lab to market over the next five years. Uh, computing is, is another example. Um, sure. uh, we, we're witnessing a revolution right now with, with AI and chat GPT. You know, it's it's one of those moments where, wow, <laughs> you, you spend five minutes playing with what's going on and, and the world has changed, like clearly. The question is, you know, as you add quantum to that, we have a few examples like in specific problems of cryptography, um, but it's still kind of we're sort of still in the kind of wild west. We don't know all the applications of what adding quantum to information science will do. It's hard to predict because we don't have computers yet to play with. And if you look at the history of deep learning and machine learning, there were a lot of theories, but you really couldn't prove any of them out until you had really big computers and a lot of data to see if they would work. And it turns out that they work, but we still really kind of don't understand why they work so right. well. And it's it's probably going to be similar with quantum information for computing. We we have a couple examples where we think there's big wins, but over time, you know, as we build bigger and bigger computers, and we're still at the 50 qubit, you know, very small, very noisy analog systems. But as we get bigger ones, um, we hope that uh, it'll be better. So that's sort of the motivation. So that's probably why people care. For science, this is just an amazing way to push your understanding of the universe. For technology, we hope there are some uh, Im implications that will, you know, really affect humanity for the better. And for the end, the, the enabling agencies like the Patent Office, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, you know, all this investment and you know potential for economic prosperity, but also concerns for national security, means they have to care too. 
So we have you know at least 13 agencies who have equities in quantum. The big ones are Department of Defense, who's got many different funding agencies within it itself. We mentioned DARPA, but there's also Army sure. Research Lab, Navy Research Lab, and so on. National Science Foundation, Department of Energy, National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST, um, the intelligence community, which has its own labs like LPS and also IARPA, yep. the intelligence DARPA. So there are many agencies who fund R&D, and then there are many agencies who care about technology right, or, or could use this technology like NIH. So all those people come together in OSTP. You know, the Office of Science and Technology Policy at the White House is the place where we coordinate um, science investment at the end of the day in, in the United States. All the agencies, we have a veter- very federal approach to science funding in the US. You know, the agencies have a lot of autonomy and their own missions um, to fulfill. So, but there's a negotiation between Congress, the White House, and the agencies about how much funding goes to what fields, um, you know, what are the priorities, what, what, how do we coordinate so we don't duplicate work at different agencies? And a lot mm-hmm. of that work happens in subcommittees within OSTP. Yeah. That's where ultimately, you know, quantum has, that, that's where the agencies come together to talk about, talk through things. This all came to a head around 2018, even a bef- few years before 2018. In 2018, the National Quantum Initiative Act was passed by Congress, which formally created or legislated two subcommittees on quantum, one led by the civilian agencies, uh, DOE, NSF, NIST, the other led by the defense intelligence agencies, DOE again, Mm -hmm. remember, because it's got two components, DOE, uh, DOD and NSA. And it created my office, the National Quantum Coordination Office. We we are extremely unique. Um, We have detailees from each of these major R&D funding agencies who are government quantum physicists or computer scientists who who are on loan to to the White House to mm-hmm. work together to coordinate all this all this all these activities and engagement with the public and so on. It created it, it asked NIST to help launch a industry consortium called the Quantum Economic Development Consortium. It created mm-hmm. a presidential advisory committee. So it did all these things to help oversee a, a major national initiative. In addition, it, it you know it spurred much more funding for quantum. So over the last few years, we've seen a doubling of funding for quantum investment in R&D in the U.S., 13 new um, centers, National Quantum Information Science Centers have been stood up by Department of Energy, National Science Foundation, and the DOD and the IC. So a lot of lot of progress. And, and maybe most importantly, it asked us, and this is something we started at OSTP even before NQI Act um, was passed. And at that time, I was the executive secretary representing my agency in one of these committees. It, it asked us to write a national strategy for quantum. You know, what are the priorities? How do we break up the work among the agencies? How do we track progress? Um, so that's very important because the act of agencies at different points of view, <laughs> just right. like human beings, everybody's got their own opinions. Everybody's got their own missions to fulfill in the agencies. So they have different assessments of the of the different technologies. Some might think they matter, some might think they not, some might care about one thing or another. And it's really important, and maybe our greatest function, the act of writing something down, forcing these experts to sit down and together write a national strategy is the coordination mechanism. Because it, it forces you to say like, here's what I care about and don't care about. And, and understand what your your colleagues and the other you know, other agencies do, and then kind of decide together in the in the best sort of wisdom of crowds scenario what the nation should do. What are mm-hmm. our gaps? What do we need to work on? So, if I had to summarize that, you know, our national strategy focuses on getting the science right. It focuses on strengthening U.S. competitiveness and enabling our people. So, you know, by getting the science right, I mean this is still a critical and emerging technology. You know, we right. don't know all the applications yet. Right. Still a lot of science, hard science to do to make these dreams of, of new technologies a reality. And we need to keep our eye on the ball, you know, right. find those applications, work on the hard technical problems to, to understand whether further investment is needed. Because you don't want to waste all your funding, your money, your taxpayer um, support on infrastructure that you don't need 
So keeping it science first is, is very important. For competitiveness, it's really about how do we move fast? How do we keep the science going, working with our, our the global world, where you know science happens everywhere, and quantum is very much has always been a global phenomenon. Um, how do we move fast, but also protect our investments? You know, so we we're not taking advantage of, we're not creating risks um, for our people through. You know, we mentioned that the quantum computer could could be at risk to our our encrypt cryptographic systems that right. you know are the backbone of internet commerce of our national security you know, phones and so on. How do we balance that? Uh, and then third, how do we enable our people? You know, how do we ensure that all the new jobs that are coming from this, that we're prepared, that, that, that people have been educated and inspired to, to learn these skills, and also that the most people possible can take advantage of these new technologies, that it doesn't just help the few. So those three things kind of summarize our goals for the, the, the national quantum ecosystem. And then you break them down to science, infrastructure, workforce, industry, security, international cooperation. And that creates, you know, kind of lines of work where we all sure. need to take pieces off and, and do it. Does that help? I, no, but, it's, per it's perfect. And, and it, you know, leads, it leads beautifully into the next, uh, the next question I wanted to ask you, because, you know, clearly um, a lot of national interests, uh, as you were just pointing out, uh, but your your group has also, um, you know, been involved in some of these international roundtables because I, I'm assuming like, you know, other, let's say, mega projects out there, whether it's, you know, fusion energy or, you know, pandemic prevention in the future, things like that, uh, we need some of our allies involved with some of the, I guess, the, the harder parts of these problems. I know you've hosted some of these roundtables with Australia and Canada and Switzerland and different uh, countries like that. T talk, uh, remedy those two. I mean, uh, bring bring that yeah. component in, if you would, because obviously it's important that <laughs> our allies, we're, we're sort of in sync, especially when it comes to the, the national security issues here. But uh, take us through that part of it, if you would, Charlie. Yeah, this is this is a very important part of our national strategy. The international quantum cooperation piece is, is one of our six pillars of the strategy. Um, quantum information science technology is really the quintessential critical and emerging technology. Uh, that's sort of a term of phrase that we've come to be used in, in the government. It's, it's emerging because we don't know the applications yet, you know, even we're 20 years in, but it's still very new. Um, we have a lot of work to do there to understand how it's going, but it's critical because we already, even from the first days of this becoming a field, knew that there were dual, dual use applications of this, right. that you could use it uh, to hack as, as a cyber weapon, and that that would if the if those proposals ideas came to pass, that it would ultimately mean that we would have to change, for example, our whole way of doing cryptography, mm -hmm. of doing you know protecting our secure communications, and that the investment in technology you had to think about how do you how do you you know take advantage of the open science community that we've all come to rely on for the last hundred years. Right globally with this, you know, potential to do harm, like, like any technology, any technology that's true, any advanced technology, but for quantum, because the first killer app, the first example of a really exponential win compared to the classical version was cryptography. You really had to address all these concerns right at the beginning. You need to, at the very beginning, think about, well, what does the research security mean here? What should we protect and not protect and so on? What should be expert control? And doing that effectively requires working with our partners. It requires creating an international multilateral partnership to create a, you know, a trusted, a safe research environment for scientists who can continue to be scientists. You know, at the end of the day, uh, moving the science forward is, is, is very important. Otherwise, you don't want to fool yourself. Rule number one, <laughs> you don't, don't fool yourself. So moving the science forward, getting the science right is, is the most important thing. And making our scientists and professors and students feel safe in that environment is very important. And then multilaterally, it's very important that if you do try to protect things via expert controls or regulation, 
that you do it in a very large way. Otherwise, you disadvantage industry in one country versus another. And it's very important to have a fair market. One of the critical things to understand about quantum computing and, and quantum sensing and networking is that it's a very broad technology. There's not one thing we're trying to protect. There's many, many different ways to do these the very different uh, applications. There's very different ways to make them. No one country is going to pursue all of them at the full, full, full bore. You know, so it's a very global um, supply chain of companies who make all the parts you need to build a quantum computer or sensor network who, you know, do the software. And so you need to create that trusted marketplace. So that's been, you know, this this international cooperation piece has been an important part at the beginning. And we've done more than just have roundtables. We've signed uh, a large number now of bilateral quantum cooperation statements with, with countries, the countries who have, there's no perfect order to do these things, but the, we, we try to start with the countries who have a long history in quantum or have national quantum strategies of their own and have thought about these issues and then codify just at a high level what are our shared values you know what do we would we all agree that we need to do we need to keep we need to make a fair market we need to create a safe research environment and so on um so that's very important to set the tone and then a- after we do that we start talking about multilaterally and this is where the round tip was coming we hosted one in may at the white house we called it the two to the N versus two N <laughs> conference, maybe the geekiest White House conference ever. But the idea is in, like in quantum, you get a big multiple when you put more people, more particles together than you would normally get. So it's way better to work together and be first than try to beat each other and be second or last because there the really is um uh, that would be really bad at the end of the day for our economic and national pro- you know, prosperity and security. So through these multilateral efforts, we, we try to address these issues. Again, you know, what do we mean by uh, research security? How do we coordinate export controls through the various various different mechanisms? How do we move the whole world to quantum resistance or post-quantum cryptography? Because that will take you know, many years, and it's not going to be a hard process. It's like, it's Y2K, but for quantum, it, it's even right, right. Bit harder. Um, and, and, so, and, and many of those issues. Uh, mm-hmm. The other big issue internationally is people. Uh, yeah. We have a need for uh, people educated in, in a very STEM heavy, deep tech skill sets, physics, computer science, chip design, RF engineering, uh, material science, all countries are facing the same problem. We we have more job openings in our industry, international, in our governments, in in our universities than than there are applicants. We need to work together to cross train because again, you know, there's a lot of different people are pursuing different. It's a big phase space of of potential technologies, and also to just um, lift all the boats by sharing best practices of how do we educate and inspire. And then World Quantum Day is a great example of that, uh, but along those lines, one of the first things we did as a multilateral body was launch the Entanglement Exchange. So if you go to entanglementexchange.org, each country has agreed to maintain their own Entanglement Exchange webpage, which hosts, mm-hmm. it just lays out some of the opportunities. So if you want to come work here or if you want to work overseas, here are the programs that we have you can take advantage of. Here are some some places to look about visa issues and so on. So it's a great first step. And everybody mm-hmm. agrees the people issue is is one of the most important, and if we can if we can lift all boats, it's better for ev- for everybody. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and on that note, um, you know, if we if we move out of country but we substitute company, um, you know, as mentioned, there are private sector players that you know are dabbling in this space. I mentioned NTT. Um, you know, I, I'm a, a really cool guest that I had on from previously from DARPA and now she's at Raytheon. Um uh, Zhejiang Zhao, really interesting things happening at Raytheon in terms of uh the cryogenic computing and then optics and all that stuff. Um you know Charlie we're we're in this funny world now in 2023 where you know People are scared of a lot of stuff. I mean, you know, people are going ape over this chat GPT stuff and AI and all that. Um, and as you were just mentioning, it's sort of this uh, continuum of supercomputer to neuromorphic to quantum, which sort of seems to, to a layperson, you know, okay, there's probably not going to be much on top of that. Um, 
talk just a, a little bit about, you know, your perspective on um, how much private sector versus um, public sector involvement with this one is is right. Um, you know, Robert, you know, Michael Crichton wrote this book, Timeline, several years ago, and they built the quantum computer, and then they went, immediately invented time travel after that. I know we're not <laughs> going there, but um, what's the right balance for this thing? It's a private good, it's an interesting question and, and, and something I often think about because it's been a wild ride. You know, over the last 20 years, if you go back 20 years ago, if you go back like 90s, early 90s, late 80s, quantum information science was for weirdos in some sense. Like you you, you wouldn't get a, a PhD in that if you want to go get a job. It was, it was a very foundational sort of like string theory you know, you're right. passionate about understanding how the universe works, very theoretical. And after Shor's algorithm and, and the discovery that quantum error correction is possible, one thing I didn't mention before is that quantum systems are analog. So you might imagine that building an analog quantum computer, we know is very hard, doesn't tend to scale. It just turns out that quantum mechanics enables uh, good error correction because errors are digital. You know, those two discoveries really motivated quantum computing to become a field okay for us more conservative types to get a PhD in. <laughs> so, but at the end of 2005, when I got my PhD, there were no <laughs> industry jobs. You know, even in 2007, when I was coming out of my postdoc, there was very few options. You know, there was a few companies who were pioneering IBM, Microsoft, but, you know, it, it was pre the, what we see now. So the government was a, a great option if you really wanted to move the field forward. Going to DARPA was a great way to spur that, you know, translation from universities, national labs to industry. And so I've seen over the last decade or so how this field has become more commercialized. And it's, it's been really interesting to watch. I think at the end of the day, again, it comes back to this fact. Foundational shifts in information technology don't happen very often, right? I think this is the second one. You know, one happened when, with von Neumann and one hap is one happening with quantum information. Mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're a skeptic, you can say, look, quantum computers are incredibly hard to make. We don't know that it's even possible to make a big enough one. You know, we have 50, 100 qubits now. They're very noisy. You know, the, the algorithms that you can cost that would actually do something useful that we couldn't do now on a, a big computer or even your laptop require probably millions of qubits, you know, maybe less, maybe more, a long way away. And there are things that um, technologically are much harder to do in a quantum computer than a classical computer. For example, the reason computers work is that one of the main reasons, one is digital logic, that they're very robust to noise, you know. Uh, each transistor will work you know, 10 to the 30 times before it fails. Quantum computers, qubits are much more delicate. Forget about that. Even right. without that, you know, the processor in my laptop has a billion, five billion transistors, you know, but it only has like a few thousand wires going to that processor. Mm -hmm. That that wire ratio makes a big difference in actually making technology. For qubits, mm -hmm. as far as we know, Every qubit needs a lot of love. You need at least one wire, if not 10. So if you need a million qubits, you need millions and millions of wires. Nobody's ever done any kind of technology like that, where you need that much control and um, ability to read out very sensitive things and very sensitive analog. So if you're a skeptic, it seems really hard. And then if you look at the applications, we don't have that many examples of a quantum computer that you know are really home runs, you know, cryptography, we, we've worked on it for 20 years. We have a good idea that, yeah, we need to move the quantum resistance cryptography because it's, it, it, we have, if we have to protect information for 25 years or 50 years, whether it's government communications um, or medical data, yeah, yeah, you got to worry about 50 year timelines in quantum computers because this application, you know, seems real and we have not hit a no go for building a large scale quantum computer. So if you're conservative, you really have to, you have to be conservative and, and move to a new mm -hmm. cryptographic system. And that's the basis of a, a presidential order that 
President Biden signed back in May, NSM 10, or National Security Memorandum 10 on Cloud Computing, which basically directs the agencies to move within a certain time frame, mm. um, but also promoting quantum leadership and, and, and technology protection. Uh, so yes, if you're a skeptic, there's not a lot of applications. Chemistry, you know, we have some examples. There are heuristic applications like machine learning like things, which it's hard to, unless until you have a big enough quantum computer, which we don't know how big it needs to be, prove that they won't be good. But if you're a skeptic, it's easy to be negative. So there's there's some reason for skepticism, but the optimism starts with this fundamental fact that yeah. <laughs> information technology shifts don't happen often. And woe is the person who makes predictions about how right. technology can evolve, right? Yeah. So for that reason, you would expect that the companies who have investments or whole foundations, their business is based on information technology, need to care, right? Yeah. So you know, my, IBM, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, uh, NVIDIA, you know, people who make high-performance computers, who, who do large computations, need to care about it. And they've over the last ten years have started groups of one size or another to see how you know I think to maintain awareness to pursue the technology to and, and hope that you know in this regime where we don't know when when the when the event will happen where an application will be found or the the size of the system will get big enough for it to actually matter to somebody somebody would pay to use it besides research you know it's 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 important to not miss that boat. Right. right, so that that has motivated the bigger IT companies to understand. It's motivated application uh, end user uh, companies to, to to need to have some awareness of when does this matter, when does it not matter, and it's motivated venture capitalists to invest in companies that you know may hit it big. You know, if right. they can make it sooner than anybody else. So I think that's what's happened, and and the reality of it is as you go from you know, all this is based on the 20 years of government investment to go from, can you make a qubit to, we can make two and those two qubits work. <laughs> and so once you've got two, you, you, you need to move to another level of engineering where you say, well, can you put 50 together? Right. And they, they still work or does it get worse? And that requires, you know, engineering, systems engineering, electrical engineering, all, all different types of, um, of, of skills that companies are good at. And, and so I think we, we've seen something very healthy, which is companies are, are taking what's been developed in academia, trying to put it together into systems, hooking it up to their existing systems like cloud computers and letting people see if they can find applications that matter. Sensing is a different story because sensing, we already have great examples like clocks, MRI right. of like mega wins. And now it's a matter of, how do we evolve other technologies like gravity sensors or inertial sensors using quantum components? And, and when does that crossover happen? Because now you're competing with something very, very good classically that has 50 years of investment versus the new guy in the block, which might be smaller or lower power, but has to prove itself, right? But in a much more evolutionary uh, way. Whereas in quantum computing, the, the worry is there could be something like, you know, fundamentally better for certain problems that could really matter. So I think that's where my sense of the field is, is a lot of enthusiasm. Um, and I think, you know, it's just like capitalism, capitalism works that way. You know, the, the new world, people took a lot right. of shifts <laughs> trying to find gold. <laughs> some will make it, some won't. Right. Um, but taking some measured bets here makes sense. And, and the question is how, how long will it actually take? How many more cycles of hype and, and troughs of you know um, disillusion will we have to go through to find for quantum computing when it will really make a difference? Right. Speaking of you know that now transition to sort of the next generation um, and, and and sort of getting them interested in in, in continuing uh, this journey. I, I three kids in this house myself. I, I say I, any of you, any of you interested in quantum? <laughs> physics they'll stare at me like i'm nuts but um you, tomorrow is world quantum day um you have a bunch of other programs the q12 partnership uh quantum to go you, you've created some really interesting games in the past at uh at lps um talk a little bit about sort of uh inspiring this next quantum generation if you would Charlie. 
Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if the science is first, you know, um, people are double first, right? <laughs> you know, it, at the end of the day, all the programs I've run, you know, all the research we've done, it's because of people who've made that happen. So it's, it's, it's the most important thing. And I've done, so we, we really care about it here in the coordination office. Um, uh, I've cared about it in my own career, you know, back before I had kids, I've got two, two kids. I made a game called mechanic, you know, that, you know, when I could still stay up late <laughs> and do side <laughs> projects like that. And, and the idea was, look, gra- we understand gravity or think we do growing up. And that's because we fall a lot. <laughs> we drop <laughs> things, we fall, we get hurt, we learn. Quantum mechanics happens at the microscopic realm. We don't experience that in our daily lives. So we don't develop intuition of it. So the, the idea is, could you, with that game was, could you develop intuition by bringing quantum mechanics macroscopically, you know, by making it into a game like Sudoku that has quantum properties? And and could you find the people who are naturally, like the people who are good at languages can be found through games. Can you find people who are good at making quantum circuits through games and teach them some intuition so that they when, when they get older, they're like, man, these guys are, these are geniuses because, uh, because they, they just, it just, it's just intrinsic to, uh, it, it just internalized it. And so that's just an example. But here's what it means to me, you know, and I, and I ha- just like anybody else, I based it on my own career and experiences. At the end of the day, it starts, it, it's got to end with careers. You know, there has to be jobs. And yeah. we have seen that in quantum, there are a lot of people hiring now. And if you look at the skill sets, of what it takes to build a quantum computer or a quantum sensor network or a, or a quantum entanglement network, you know, electrical engineering, uh, physics, uh, radio frequency, microwave engineering, chip design, AI, computer science, like those skill sets, if you get trained in those and quantum doesn't pan out, you're going to be okay. Like, I'm not, I'm not worried about those people. Yeah. Like, that is a net benefit to the world and to you if you become an expert in any of those fields, because those are the industries of the future, autonomy, AI, robotics, quantum. Um, So it's a good investment. There's going to be jobs no matter what. Then let's go back. You know, how do you get there? I I think, you know, obviously it starts with inspiration, you know, uh, people getting excited about uh, physics, STEM, quantum can we use the hype around quantum to inspire people that to take that one more course or to convince themselves that they can be a scientist or or any other number of things that support it um how do you uh, educate them you know how do we build curricula at all age levels that gets people comfortable with the con some of the concepts that they'll hear later when they make those decisions about what career paths to go into and then how do you give people experiences you know i i mentioned that I, you know, was interested in science, but science is a long road. You know, there are times in your career where you will sit in your room and say, I'm going to be the dumbest physicist in the world. (laughs) And, and you've got to decide, I'm going to keep going, even if I'm the dumbest. And, And what made you decide to do, to keep going? And I think for me, it was experiences like after school program or summer internship where I worked in a environment with people actually people who are actually doing science or technology and saw that there were humans that I can make a contribution, even as a, as a kid to moving that forward. And so it, it, beyond just taking classes and getting grades, like right. when it gets down to it, there's a lot of things needed to move something forward and people bring different skill sets. You know, some are incredibly good at mathematics and programming. Some are incredibly good at the marketing aspect. Some are just good at painting the walls, like in this sort of startup environment where you're trying to just get it done, it's all hands on deck. You know, you can bring a lot of different skill sets. You know, having grown up installing, um, you know, air conditioners with my dad, I, I could fix some stuff. So <laughs> that was yeah. turned pretty useful, even though I became a theoretical physicist. You know, so you can, if you're passionate, if you're willing to learn, you can contribute. And there are many different People, all different types of people end up contributing to this. And, and that's what we've been trying to convey 
in the Q12 partnership in what we, in our outreach over World Quantum Day through all the activities at the White House. The Q12 in particular, you know, it's a spin on K12. Sure. It tries to bring the, the quantum computing companies, the educational uh, uh, organizations like IEEE, um, American Physics Teachers Association, even high school teachers, scientists together to develop curricula, to develop profiles of people who have ended up in this field, you know, all different backgrounds. You know, I mentioned that you know, I'm a son of an immigrant. Um, that's important for people to see that they're, it's not just the Einstein crazy hair guy, professor, genius that the world needs, you know, to move quantum forward, we need everybody. Yep. And we cannot afford to not take advantage of everybody we've got. You know, it's, 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 it's a competitive world out there. We don't have enough people now. We need to, we need this pull, pull from everybody. So expanding that capacity of the United States to generate people is a big part of what we do. Another example is National Science Foundation has launched a program called Expand Quiz, which is has this basic philosophy of look, we can't look to the top twenty-five graduate schools to generate people. We need to we need to broaden that out. We need more institutions creating people. And how do you do that? How do you get more people to go there? How do you get them the infrastructure they need? How do you get them leading research grants and not just following? So hey, this idea of capacity building of people is is probably the most important thing we need to address as a country in the next you know one three decades or hundred years. Absolutely. So that's that's kind of my motivation. You know, how do you how do you develop unique experiences to keep people going and convince them this is you know one of the best career opportunities you've got uh, to make a really big influence on the on the world. Um, it, it, I'll also mention you know some of the sciencey stuff that goes into that. Uh, at LPS, we've launched something called the Cubic Collaboratory, and mm -hmm. really the idea behind that is how do we contribute to the National Quantum Initiative pursuing new types of qubits and the hard technical problems, but also how do we create a pipeline of talent that the government can hire? Because, you know, I told you that when I was looking at, when I left academia, there weren't many jobs. Go government was the, one of the best places in the world, but now there's a lot of options. Yeah. And so we, get, us hiring people, me, I hire, I hire a lot of people, um, it's getting much harder because, you know, people have a lot of options. So how do we get people to realize how, awesome it is to work in the government, how much impact you can have as a young age. And the way we address that was creating fellowships where people come and spend a summer at LPS and do research with us and, and just see what program managers do, see what government research labs are do, see, you know, the options you can have to make a difference. Um, it's really important. The other thing we've done is launch the Qubit Foundry. So if you're a new professor coming out, even of a leading research group, and you go to a university anywhere mm -hmm. over the country, there's a huge cost of entry. If you want to make your own devices, you often have to buy, you know, a $3 million tool to deposit yeah. them. You know, we need many different tools. So what we're doing is making qubits at other places like Lincoln Labs, companies, and giving those to universities so they can do the measurements. They can actually explore the space of making qubits. And this is where the democratizing spin qubits partially came from. Or, or, or I guess the outcome of that opinion article was, well, how can we really accelerate the pace of science right. by lowering the barriers to entry? And one way to do that is to make qubits easier to make or or give people qubits. And, and we're doing both, but the giving you qubits part has been very successful. It means that you can be at, you know, a very small university and get the best qubits in the world and do measurements and make a very novel contribution, you know, to, to the field. And th th those are ways to create more people because there's a lot of talent out there. They just don't have access for various yeah. reasons to, 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 to the, what's going on at the, the state of the art. And, and a big part of my mission is to, to just make that bigger. Um, and, you know, my, my message is always quantum is more than quantum physics. You know, this is this is an example of a very exciting field, but you know, learning, participating in this, whether you end up doing this or another thing adjacent, it's a net win to the country. It's a net win to yourself. You know, so for parents out there, for the for the kids and students out there, this is a pretty cool thing to do. And uh, I, yeah, no, and, and, and I, I'm 
I'm playing the same mess again, the same message inside this house. And now I got a an awesome an awesome episode to show us that to sit down and watch. So no, I <laughs> I appreciate you sharing all that, Charlie. Um well, one I really appreciate your time. I, one one last thing while I have you, I just have to ask, because I'm um I'm a child of the, the late 60s, early mm-hmm. 70s. And um I grew up with the show Kung Fu. And I'm a big fan of Kane and Master Poe <laughs> and, and the whole series. I've watched it many times growing up. Um, say a couple words, if you would, about Charlie Tehan's philosophy of Kung physics, if you would. <laughs> philosophy of quantum physics? Is that Kung, what Kung, Kung, Kung physics. physics. Oh, uh, you, you must have looked at my website, which is oh, really yeah. old. <laughs> no, but it was cool, though. <laughs> that thing, I, I, was, I was on that for a while. I'm a big fan. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I mentioned, you know, these things are the strange things that happen in your life that make a difference. It's, it's about people, right? So I was graduating from Wisconsin. It, it happened that um, my parents' neighbor, you know, rented the house. He happened to be an NSF program manager. And again, I was totally naive. Like I didn't understand government or program manager or anything. He was a chemistry professor from Michigan. Uh, he was on, you know, spending a, a year or two at NSF. NSF brings people in to, to, to manage your programs who are experts and then sends them back. And he, you know, we, we talked, there was a barbecue or something. He said, like, he found out I was uh, getting a PhD. He said, you should apply for this program, this international postdoc program at NSF doesn't exist now. It was the most crazy, amazing, wonderful thing you can imagine. It basically said, write us a proposal for what you want to do. We need to work outside the U.S. We will give you money. We'll just put in your bank account and Godspeed, right? <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> and so I wrote this crazy proposal, which was to, to work at Cavendish Lab at the University of Cambridge with one of the, um, uh, the, the director at the time. And also spend time at the University of Tokyo in Japan. They, they Sego Terucho is a famous quantum dot physicist, and um, Lloyd Hollenberg at the, the Center for Quantum Computing Technology in Australia. Australia is a, was a world is a world leader in quantum computing. I happen to have a lot of cousins in Australia too, and so they said yes. Right, oh, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it's somewhat terrifying because you know as you leave the U.S., you, you lose all your health insurance. You're like right. you're just nomad, and. I don't know, maybe the one of the reasons I justified in my mind was like Kane and in, in, in Kung Fu, you know, I, I travel the earth trying to do <laughs> physics, trying to help people do quantum. Um, it was, you know, an amazing experience. And I, I'd say that after the, you know, gruel of, of grad school, uh, maybe not the best thing to do for, you know, <laughs> kind of the loneliness point of view, because it, it is, you're, you're quite itinerant. And actually, when I ended up in in Cambridge, this is another good story for people going through their careers. You know, I was like burnt out. I was like, I am done. <laughs> I mean, I even went so far as to take an LSAT prep course. I was like, I'm going to be a lawyer. There you go. <laughs> the worst thing you can do as a scientist. Uh-huh. I was there, and um, and I just decided, like, I'm in Cambridge. I'm just going to do every possible curricular extracurricular activity I can. And Cambridge is one of the most amazing places in the world. I took a violin making class. I made a violin. I learned to dance for the first time. I became a salsa nice. dancer. Eventually I met my wife that way. You know, I, I did, every, I met, you know, a lot of great friends. I just took a pause. I still do some science, you know, but I took a pause and I was like, I need to get my life in order. Right. And, you know, that, fundamentally changed my life i mean yeah. no question about it it brought balance right um because you can you know i worked every day in grad school and i was very motivated uh, very passionate kind of person but that burns you out over time so I, f- I found a lot of balance that's where the kung physics you know article or page came from i, re- I really enjoyed that and i could see you know i could see charlie tahan wandering the earth and preaching about one six and it is it it was, it was just a it was an enjoyable piece and so you know again i just wanted to come full circle on that one but uh i mean you know, talking about kane and his journey i mean you're this is an amazing journey charlie i i just um so enjoyed um listening to you and and, and seeing how all this has evolved and now what you're in, involved in now i just you know i wish you the best um at uh you know 
this role uh, there's multiple roles that you're you're serving and just continuing to to advance this all important set of technologies across government industry academia as you're doing so really fascinating stuff any any final messages before we we do our wrap up anything else that i missed <laughs> i know we talked about a lot but please uh yeah, if, I mean, if just, I missed just it. thank you for doing these i mean i think it's great to actually talk to normal people like me who <laughs> and then the others we've got who who uh who are just trying to do stuff and my one message is anyone can quantum you know so don't be scared look out for mentors and, and just ask people and uh, it's it's an amazing future that you can have um if you're if you're open to it thanks awesome message awesome message uh, again, for everybody that's going to be listening to this episode of our show across the various podcast networks or watching on our YouTube channel, again, you've been spending time with Dr. Charlie Tahan, Assistant Director, Quantum Information Sciences, Director, National Quantum Coordination Office in the White House, Office of Science and Technology Policy. Uh, Charlie, again, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your schedule. I got one more thing. Me. Please, go ahead. Which is, you know, World Quantum Day may come out before or after this video right but please check out quantum.gov for all the stuff we do we've got some really cool videos coming out on world quantum day that you're going to want to watch um and, and other things we're going into hundreds of schools across the country to bring quantum uh modules uh to to students with a scientist so check out all the twitter feed and and the cool stuff that's going to come out there's a lot of really cool cool things that i think you'll like and we will put links to uh, to all of that in uh, in the bio of the show as well. But again, Charlie, thanks so much. As we say here on our show, you know, thanks for creating a better tomorrow via what you're doing. Really, such a great story. Really appreciate this. Thank you.